Hello everyone, my name is Tai Mitsuji and I'm here with the fantastic James Drinkwater for Art Collector Magazine. Today we're going to be discussing his latest show, I Love You More Than Painting, which opens at Nicholas Thompson Gallery on April 15. Hey James. Hello Tai, how are you? Wonderful, thanks. Um, so I was hoping that you could tell me a little bit about this new show that you have coming up. My son came home with a drawing and at the bottom of the drawing, it just said, I love you more than painting. <laughs> and it just seemed to encapsulate everything that I've been sort of hammering towards for the last five years, I suppose, about intimacy and place and, and my loved ones and the theatre that, um, the theatre that plays out with all those dynamics. And this, you know, this little drawing and um, his sentiment seemed to sort of just all that compounded into one moment because he knows that apart from family, um, there's nothing I love more than paintings. So for him to say he loves me more than paintings is trying to lend himself into my, yeah. my world and, you know, say, I love you more than paintings. That, like, says, it was a major statement to sort of hear and um, it came at the right time while I was painting the show and just seemed to fit. Because I, less and less do, do I need the narrative to be really singular mm -hmm. and, you know, about one narrative, one storyline. It's more and more becoming about, um, yeah, lots and lots of things all at once. So this, that was a perfect kind of umbrella to let all these works fall under. That's fantastic. That's, that's so interesting. So did you hear that come up with that title at the end or at the beginning of, of when? Oh, it was halfway through. Yeah. And thematically it just suited how I was feeling and what was happening. That's great. So, so what are some of the sort of themes or motifs that we can find in, in your show? Oh, look, I'm still sort of, I'm still lost in the figure. It seems to provide me um, everything I need to hang all my stuff on, to hang my coat on. So um, it is a continuum of those that I love um, as the stars of my uh, world and theatre and you know, it's, it's about intimacy more and more. It's just about that one core thing. I keep coming back to it. And this is about that too. But um, while, I was, while I was painting the show, I started thinking about, I'd well, go for these late night swims, which yeah. we're still able to do actually. And um, across the ocean baths at night under the stars. And I've often just, or in the ocean, and I pull myself back and look at the sky which is just a lovely thing to do. And one night I was with a friend and I screamed out, Chris, I'm a boat, I'm a boat. And this <laughs> metaphor, as cheesy as it is, of man or myself or yeah. you know, as a boat um, and the contents of that boat, uh, you know, are those that I care for and love. So, in, and then when all this uh, COVID-19 stuff blew up, it felt even more relevant to become some kind of vessel to to contain those that you want to keep alive and safe and well. So I started thinking of myself as a, as a boat, some kind of beaten rowboat because it's loaded with nostalgia, which is what I love. <laughs> and, and then I was listening to, um, this is just how it all ricochets around. I was listening to Anne Thompson talk about um, Ian Fairweather on the Talking With Painters podcast. Right. And she talks about, you know, the famous raft episode and I thought, no, I'm, I'm not just a boat, I'm a raft. Sometimes I'm a ship, sometimes I'm a tug, you know, like it's, yeah. the metaphor is endless. And I, I, again, I know it's, it sort of veers on the side of cliche and cheesy, but it just seemed to suit. So there's paintings in the show called Raft and Alone at Sea. And it seemed to give me a whole, whole line to sort of exhaust with all my, all my stuff. Yeah, and, and can you tell, just for everyone's sake, um, the, the sort of brief story of Ian Fairweather and the raft? That might be helpful. Oh, yeah, you might tell it better. I mean, he, um, he obviously went off the grid before going off the grid was even a thing. Yeah. And moved up to Bribey Island, which is off Queensland. And mm -hmm. I don't even think they had a bridge then. They had a postal shop where he, um, he just sort of dropped out and made very, very beautiful work on very poor materials. Yeah. and with very poor materials and lived in this sort of hut that he built fashioned out of trees and palms and all that sort of stuff. Right. And he decided to build a raft and, and sail to East Timor and it sort of hopelessly failed. And he was 
taken by customs and deported, I think back to, I'm getting, maybe getting all this wrong, back to England and which is his homeland where he studied at the Slade and all this sort of stuff. But it's the most sort of poetic, drastic, romantic, hopeless thing to do. And, um, you know, I'm always doing stuff like that, like on a, not as, <laughs> not quite like that, but I'm always sort of looking at those extra special things that you can do daily. Yeah, of course. I think it, it, it's so funny that, you know, that story resonates with you because, you know, so many of your titles resonate with me and I think they will resonate with everyone else as well. I mean, I'm a boat, the contents of my life, a thousand ideas for a rainy day, the arranging of flowers while waiting for a green car. They're so, those are just three titles from your upcoming show, but they're so fantastic because, you know, your work is sort of abstracted and sort of, you know, you can locate some figures in there, but yeah. these titles, you know, just grounded in such sort of experience, you know? When my, um, when my loved ones are feeling lousy or hopeless, I immediately start painting flowers. It's just bizarre. And then arranging flowers, this idea of arranging someone back together, fixing someone. Right. So arranging flowers and, you know, um, Lottie and I always talk about being 87 driving around in a, <laughs> $2,000 green Jaguar, <laughs> like two nut bags. Oh. And so I'm arranging flowers while waiting for the green car. So it's this, there's a lot in that. Yeah, um, and you know, like you know, building a raft, I would never build a raft and try to sail to Timor, but things like, I'm, I'm always looking for the silver lining. And right. I think at the moment it's very important. And I made some, um, I made some tap shoes in the studio. Fantastic. <laughs> and they're just so beautiful. <laughs> um, you know, the, the band on on the Titanic that keep playing is the ship sinking. Right, right, I yeah. I always, in jest, I've always said I want to play in that band. <laughs> <laughs> now some, some of my friends are like, are you still playing in that band? <laughs> More than ever. <laughs> Getting a whole nautical thing. <laughs> That's right, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, everything's yeah. going down well, here. I know, I know. I know. Oh, oh dear. Um, I don't know how much I should talk about it, to be honest. <laughs> no, no, I think it's not the time we're living in. But, you know, perhaps, you know, we can talk about that a little bit. Uh, with COVID-19, what's it like to be a painter? What's it like to be an artist, you know, at the, at the present moment? How do you think that sort of changed the landscape for you? Um, I think it's interesting because it's a collective thing. It's, yeah. um, I think it would be interesting to see what comes out of it whether people are making work about it or more about uh, the isolation and how that, and all the anxiety or how that has felt for us, it's sort of changed in the sense that we have the kids all the time, mm. which I was slightly nervous about, but it's again, finding that silver lining. It's been beautiful. We've, we've been very engaged parents, but we've never been ones to just sit and, and with, with a, low temperature and go with whatever they're doing yeah. i've kind of always thought it was a good thing that they see us working and and making making work and moving forward and that that would be a good thing to um transfer into their lives as as young adults but it's just been it's been surprisingly so so wonderful and lottie and i are just swapping days at the studio and sometimes we come as a family and we're still allowed to exercise so we're you know i spent the morning with, with the kids and we went around the rock pools and walked and swam in this little special little pool and ran and did races and just getting all that energy out. Yeah. But I'm sort of, um, I think, I think good work will happen because the baggage, you sort of feel somehow shut off. So the baggage that we feel about what, what people know about us and what we make and those preconceived ideas that come with, that can come with, with making work, it just, just, even though you try as your best never to think of an audience or, or a gallery or whatever, at the moment, all that has just completely evaporated. So I wonder if, I wonder if that's a collective thing too. We'll see. Sure. Okay. Does that make any sense? <laughs> no, it made heaps. And, and I think that's such a beautiful sort of way of putting it, that everyone's sort of uh, doing their individual pursuits and yet, you know, it's a collective condition, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, James. Thank you for your time. Thank no, you for telling you. us about your work. It's very exciting and we look forward to seeing your works online and by appointment. Me too.
Thank you, Ty. Thank you. See you, mate. Bye.